Hi, friends, and welcome back to Music Therapy and Beyond. This is Kristen, and I get to be with you as we round out the month of March with our music segment today. As I'm sure you've heard us mention already a few times this month, we musicians celebrate a lot in March. We have World Music Therapy Day, Official Music Therapy Month, Music in Schools Month, and others. So as we come to an end of this celebratory month, we are going to talk about music, of course, and music therapy and form strategies, of course. But specifically because it's Music in Schools Month, we're going to do music-informed strategies for schools. So let's dig right on in. All right, well, let's dig right in. Here at Music Therapy and Beyond, you know that we're music therapists. Music therapy is what we live and breathe every day. It's the heart and soul of what we do and the heart and soul of this podcast and our shop and the whole platform. You probably also know that music therapy is focused on addressing non-musical goals. And if you didn't, hear it from me first. Music therapy is focused on addressing non-musical goals. Music intertwines with our emotions, our regulation system, our sensory and our social behaviors, our motor systems, and other psychological processes. According to the Music Therapy Association, music therapy is the clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within a therapeutic relationship by a credentialed professional who has completed an approved music therapy program. That's our official definition of what music therapy is. We've also discussed in previous episodes ways music therapy can be used within schools, such as individual therapy to address IEP goals as a related service, um, as consultation or direct therapy for um, IEP support, in the classroom as educational support for teachers, and we've talked about lots of other avenues. You also know we've provided both in-person and teletherapy services. So you can, if you want, take a look back at those episodes, and we'll have those linked in the show notes. But today, we're going to specifically look at music therapy and form strategies in the classroom for educators and staff. Now, I do want to preface this by saying these strategies will also be helpful for parents and caregivers at home, for counselors and other allied health professionals in the clinic, as well as helpful reminders for music therapists. So I'm hoping there is a little for everyone in this episode. It is important to note before we dig right on in that these strategies are not considered music therapy. I have to say it, and I have to also caution the use of music because we always want to ensure that we're watching the responses of our students, our clients, or the individuals we're working with, specifically when we're looking um, for evidence of overstimulation, a trauma response, and even the dislike to the music experience. All of these are possible when utilizing music with individuals, especially individuals with neurodiversities. So music is a powerful tool. We know that. We're going to dig into that and educators and staff can utilize it to support the education and overall well-being of their students. But it is powerful, so please be intentional. And I hope this episode helps you do just that. Okay, so let's first look at why music is useful, and then we will look at when and how music can be useful in the classroom. Music simultaneously synchronizes neuronal firings in the brain, providing a rich environment for learning and growth. The specific characteristics of music set the brain up to regulate, learn, and process information. Music is non-threatening and captures and maintains attention. Music is highly motivating. I think probably many of us know this and have experienced this, um, especially in the classroom, and it can be used as a natural reinforcement for desired behavior or a desired response. Music is multi-sensory experience that is great at integrating different sensory stimuli, including auditory, visual, proprioceptive, vestibular, and other stimuli. 
Music is processed globally in our brain, lending itself well to working on a variety of non-musical domains such as physical motor, speech and language, emotional regulation, and many, many others. So now that we've kind of briefly gone over why music is a great tool to support development and learning specifically in the classroom, now let's look at when music might be useful in the classroom and how we can use it. So some of the most obvious and well-known times during the school day we see educators using music is morning routine and circle time. Educators use it with students, especially young children, to learn the days of the week, months of the year, the weather, and often to reinforce concepts like seasons, the alphabet, of course, and so many others. We also see educators using music with books and with hand and finger plays like the Itsy Bitsy Spider. Those are all great places to use music. The brain latches on to the predictability of the rhythm and melody and reinforces the learning. Excellent. 100% excellent. But when else? One of the most effective ways to use music in the classroom, in my opinion, is for transitions and routines. This is especially true when thinking about our friends with neurodiversities. Transitions can be one of the most difficult but important parts of the school day for all students. All students. And the same is true in our clinical music therapy sessions transition that goes poorly and the session can be really difficult and it can take a very significant turn and the like is true in the classroom a student becomes unregulated and it affects the flow of the day and the other students it can be unregulating for the teacher and the other students so how can we use music in the classroom if we are not a music therapist Okay. Educators can and do use music. You can specifically, here's an idea, use simple phrases such as it's time to put the balls away or it's time to put the toys away um, or it's time to put our books away and then we'll be all done. Another one is we're going to lunch. We're going to lunch. We're going to lunch. We're going to lunch and then we will eat. So the important points in these musical transitions are one, directive of what to do and what we are doing. So for example, um, we're putting away the balls, we're putting away the balls, we're putting away the balls. So that's the directive. This is what we're doing. We're providing it three times for reinforcement for that repetition. So we're putting away an object or in the instance of the uh, transition for lunch, we're going or walking to lunch. We are walking to lunch, we're walking to lunch. So that is the transition. That is the directive of what, what we are to do or what we are currently doing. Number two is what will happen next. And then for picking up, it's um, it's time to put the balls away. It's time to put the books away. It's time to put everything away. And then we're all done. So in that instance, what is next is we're going to be all done with that. And then sometimes you can even add, um, instead of being all done, we can say, and then we'll go to lunch. So it would maybe sound like, it's time to put the books away. It's time to put the books away. It's time to put the books away. And then we'll go to lunch. And then you can actually, if an individual or a classroom needs even more support, you can then just go right into we're going to, and so provide them that next transition. But the important things are the very first one is we are telling them what we are expecting of them, what to do or what we are doing currently, what is happening next, and then a time frame and hint the music does this one for you so it has a specific phrase it has a specific start and end point and that provides you the structure so if you use a specific song structure it already has the time frame and predictability built into it and this is where we say thank you music <laughs> So using a simple, clear, and directive phrase like these examples can be written to any popular song that is preferred by your students. Friendly reminder that preferred music is vital to ensuring a perfect brain reaction to support learning. It supports attention, motivation, and it really enhances brain chemistry so that you can 
remember what um, the music is providing to you. So that's a really big hint using preferred music. If you have listened to some of my other episodes, you know I'm a big, sort of huge fan of transitions. Thinking about all of those micro and macro transitions that happen during our day, especially in the school, oh, there's just so many. Even sitting at a desk, transitioning between subjects or activities, even at the same table, may be difficult transitions for someone. Bigger transitions are the ones we probably notice more are those when a student or a student specifically is transitioning in and out of a room. Maybe that's going to a related service or going to another project or going to lunch, recess or PE, etc. Other transitions, though, that can be difficult are those when you are physically moving spaces within the classroom. So maybe not leaving the classroom but actually inside of the classroom. So going from maybe your morning routine circle time to your desk time, or we're going morning routine specifically um, for the whole classroom that might be moving different stations. Those are all transitions. Even within a morning routine, like a morning circle or circle time, there's going to be transitions between the weather and the days of the week. Those are all little transitions that really, for some individuals, um, might be a, a time that they need a transition, a music cue for a transition. So now you might be thinking, okay, Kristen, I could be singing transitions all day long. And that's totally true. But there we don't need to be doing that. There are so many transitions that could be an issue for a student or a classroom of students, but they're not all going to be issues and you don't need to use music all day long. In fact, it would really lose its um, effect if you used it all all day long. So some of transitions your students are going to do well. So your very first step is to observe and to take notes of those times during the day when a student or a classroom tend to be more unregulated. That's going to be where you're maybe going to be clued into where you might be needing to have a music transition. So signs might be talking more, listening less, maybe one of those times when you tend to have to provide your directive multiple times. Um, Maybe when students are unable to stand still or sit still and their bodies just really need to move. Um, For some, putting hands over their ears. We're not going to dig into sensory processing today, um, but that might be a clue for some um, individuals. Or showing aggressive or adverse behaviors towards self or others. So these are all signs that might cause you to look at setting up a structured music transition. Now, caveat here, there might be a, and likely are a variety of other factors going into these behaviors, especially if we're looking at some of the more severe uh, behaviors that we um, just mentioned. But transitions might be one uh, might be one of those factors. So it's a it's an area that you can control, and it's a really easy one to to kind of address if that maybe is really helpful, and it might be significantly helpful for your classroom. Another pro tip here is to use a song the students know so that they can easily remember it, and then they can eventually learn it after multiple repetitions. I mean, ideally they learn it so well that they do it themselves. And maybe you as the educator or staff, parent, therapist, just need to use the music as a cue. So it might not be that every time you do that uh, transition, you have to be the one doing the music. It might be that they naturally do it, or maybe as you're generalizing it, you start not using the music transition, and then occasionally you use it if they need a reminder. There is so much more that we could speak about with transitions, and I would love to do that. But for this episode, let's move on to another space I want to look at today, which is regulation. Music works similarly as with transitions with regulation in that it provides predictability and structure. When regulating the body, we are giving the body what it needs and letting it know it is safe. Music can do both of those things. When music is used, it can help a student or group of students naturally adjust and regulate. And bonus, it can teach them and help them learn regulation strategies for themselves. 
this is amazing and obviously the whole point of why we teach at all is so they can learn it themselves and then be able to do it themselves. That is really the most important aspect for regulation strategies. So when we're integrating music into the classroom to address regulation, we want to maintain a simple and familiar melody, consistent tempo, and opportunities for repetition. So I'm going to repeat all of those in the um, heart of repetition here. Simple and familiar melodies, consistent tempo, and opportunities for repetition. The reason we consist, we use consistency, familiarity, and repetition is because it is predictable and familiar, and that it is safe. So all of those, the predictable and the familiarity, really support the overall feeling that music is non-threatening and it is safe. The body and brain know what to expect because it's predictable, and because it is predictable and familiar, it supports regulation. The educator can take a simple and familiar song and change the lyrics to reflect what is happening in a student's body. Now, this can be done with any song. I mean, you can use a variety of songs. I'm going to use an example today. Uh, Pharrell Williams' Happy song is a really great example. The chorus of the song is... Um, da 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 and then what we want to do is we want to reflect in uh, directions for what we're wanting them to, wanting the individual or individuals to do, but also reflecting what maybe they need. So maybe we're seeing that um, an individual really is having a hard time stilling their body. And so we really need to be focusing on getting out some energy, getting some sensory regulation, maybe into our feet. Um, so let's say this individual needs some jumping. So we can change the words. Um, I can jump, jump around, jump around, jump and then I stop. I can jump, jump around, jump around, jump around and then stop. And then you could continue on. You could use spinning. You could use stomping or squeezing. So maybe they like deep pressure squeezes. Maybe they like to rub their hands together, and that's a really good sensory for them. Um, or you could use a variety and see what works. It's always about testing and changing. So other examples might be to support regulation another way, such as supporting a calm and quiet time. It is really important for our bodies to have moments of high and low energy and that those are alternating. That is what is going to teach us regulation. And we have this one really adorable um, music experience called Turtle Breathe and Squeeze um, that is perfect for children to support a quiet mind and body and really acknowledging our bodies need to have quiet and sometimes we need to retreat at different times during the day. Um, I love this. I'll just sing... Uh, share with you a couple of the phrases in it is when I feel scared I can retreat and then it goes da 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 I can breathe in really deep then I breathe out and calm I will be that's a really quick flow through it um, but you can find the links and uh, that into our show notes for that resource and others like it. Turtle Breathe and Squeeze is easy to implement and we've provided a full packet of resources around that really sweet music exercise. Another great way to regulate and support learning is using music as a cue for focused attention. So we've talked about music supporting that regulation with jumping, spinning. We've talked about the Turtle Breathe and Squeeze that could support with quiet and calm moments so those high energy and those low energy those lower energy and now we really also can use music to help us support in focusing in our learning and that's going to be the last thing we talk about today um, this little song is really helpful in teaching and cueing attention i can listen oh yes i can i can listen with my ears i hear the song yes i can look 
Look with my eyes. I can keep my mouth and body still. And then we can repeat that. We can use it with visuals. And you can find the audio clip for that so you can implement it and incorporate it into your classroom, clinic, or home in the show notes. So please visit those. I really like using this one with older students. It's very catchy. They can sing a right along with it. All you have to do is have your body, and I love to snap with it. Um, pairing visuals also with this is really supportive of that multi-sensory learning experience. So visuals of um, I can listen, and you can have a picture of an ear, with my eyes, with my ears, and with my mouth and body still. So you can really practice each of those areas and different um, aspects of being a really good listener. Friends, the list goes on and on and on of ways to use music in the classroom to support a regulated classroom primed for learning. I could literally go on and on. As an extrovert, I get way more, I get so much energy when I am doing this and thinking about ways that you can use music in the classroom, in your clinic, in your home. I'm so passionate about this work, and I hope that 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 comes through and that we're providing you really great strategies that you can start to test and change and think about and utilize in your spaces. So really the main reason to experiment using music in your classroom is to support that natural regulation and the priming of the brain for learning. Those are just two of the best things that music can do for you. So here at Music Therapy and Beyond, we want to support music therapists 100%. We are music therapists. We want to support music therapists, students, and interns. But also, we're really passionate about getting music and making it accessible to others. So educators and counselors and other allied health professionals like OTs, PTs, SLPs, and parents and caregivers, we're passionate about it all. Music is an accessible tool, and we are hoping to support an environment for a wide variety of facilitators to use music more intentionally in the spaces they work and live. I hope this was helpful today. While these are music-informed strategies and suggestions and ideas, they are not music therapy. Music therapy is a clinic, clinical profession that um, can be incredibly helpful for individuals and groups in a variety of settings across the lifespan. If you are interested in music therapy or are interested in consulting with one of us to discuss and develop a plan for your clinic, home, or classroom, please reach out to us via email or through our um, website. Um, If we can't assist you, we will find someone who can. We're really passionate about providing that support. And as we end this episode, I wanted to leave on a few quick reminders from our episode um, to use music in any setting. Number one, pair music with visual supports such as books, visual icons and images, flashcards, etc. Remember, music is great at integrating multisensory stimuli. Number two, use preferred music. Preferred music can induce a dopamine release in our brain and body and makes us feel good, but it also supports our brain development. So make sure it's preferred and enjoyable music for the individuals you're working with. Number three, use silence to your advantage. Strategically place silence within a song can be incredibly supportive for regulation and attention. So think back to our jump, jump around, jump around, jump around and stop. Also give plenty of time for individuals to notice the silence. In that instance, stop their body before we then jump back into the song. We all need a little processing time. So use silence to your advantage. And lastly, please get creative. Feel free to change lyrics, to make them up, to make them up with your students, to have students help make you make up um, lyrics. Try different things. Be a scientist. Research what you're doing and observe, test, and change. As we wrap up this episode here, I want to thank you so much for joining us this month as we talked all about music and music therapy within schools 
and so much goodness this um, month. We had some incredible interviews full of rich content this past month um, that you can go, if you haven't had a chance to listen already, head over and check those out, episodes 52 and 53. And then we also had a really beautiful, relaxing, and mindful experience, especially for children, on last week's wellness episode, episode 54. It's a real winner. You're going to want to check that one out. And We launched a really amazing freebie over on our website this week. Be sure to check that out and grab Six Chance, and it includes visuals, extensions, and ideas. includes audios and visuals for the learning. It's a 19-page document full of rich content, all for free, all for free for you. There are seriously over 20 therapy intervention ideas within those Six Chance that can easily be implemented with individuals or groups, whether you are a professional music therapist therapist, an educator, a counselor, OTPTS, SLP, or a parent or caregiver. We hope you love it and find that it fills you with creative ideas and grounding music to bring to the individuals you serve. All right, that's it for today. Thank you for being here and for sharing your time with us. See you next week. For show notes and resources in today's episode and all episodes, head to our website, musictherapyandbeyond.com. Reach out to us at musictherapyandbeyond at gmail.com and follow us on social media to stay up to date on all the content and announcements. We'll see you next time.